Hello, Bookmatic lifelong learners. We have a great guest here on the Bookmatic Best Books podcast, Mark W. Schaefer, the author of Cumulative Advantage and Marketing Rebellion, um, and also several other best selling books, uh, as well as uh, Rutgers University uh, faculty member, two master's degrees. Uh, you, you've got it going on, Mark. <laughs> so uh, thank you well, so I've much. Been, I've been around a long time. I've been around a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you so accomplishments, much. accomplishments aren't so great if you think about how long they've been spread out. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, like, also, I noticed that you, uh, you were like mentored by Peter Drucker as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. It's quite an amazing part of my, my life. He was um, teaching at the Claremont Graduate University, and they actually named the business school after him there. And he was at the end of his career. I mean, I guess he was officially retired from, uh, you know, consulting, but he's still very active writing. And, and I, I wanted to be part of that program. I applied and applied and applied. I kept getting rejected. And um, finally I got in, I was the youngest person ever accepted to the program with him. And it was, yeah, I got my MBA, but I got to study under him for three years. So it was really quite, quite an amazing opportunity. For sure. You, you must have learned a whole lot, life-changing uh, opportunity there. And uh, now you're passing on your knowledge to uh, to a whole lot of other people. You do like speaking engagements and uh, writing a bunch of books, and uh, you've got a really strong social media platform and community and blogging. I mean, uh, that you are an ideal person to learn from. I think. Yeah, it's <laughs> funny when I I you know had a long career in the business world, and um, when my daughter was little. I was helping her with her homework and she said, daddy, when I'm at school, I get so confused with this. I don't understand. But when you explain it, I understand you should be a teacher. <laughs> and I think, I think eventually that's what happened uh, because I do teach in everything that I do, whether I'm speaking, blogging, writing a book, uh, you know, it's time for me, you know, at this stage of my life to pass on what I know and, send the elevator back down and help other people. Yeah. And I mean, would you say that in a way, marketing is kind of like teaching in a way, or uh, uh, how would you categorize marketing? Oh, that's, yeah, that's an interesting way to think about it, Matt. Um, hmm. Is marketing like teaching? You know, I think, I think in many ways it is. I mean, marketing to me, is, is really exciting because it's, it's, it's always changing. You know, if you work in economics or finance or accounting, it, it, it just doesn't change with the pace that marketing does. Marketing is driven a lot by trends and tastes and the different demographic characteristics of each generation. And it's, it's just you know, moving, moving. It's like waves in an ocean coming at you, just never stopping. And then mm -hmm. the ways we can ride those waves and connect to those trends keeps changing in terms of the technology and social media. So um, uh, working in, in, in marketing is not for the faint of heart, that is for sure. But to me, it's really exciting. I think, um, Certainly, marketing is definitely about learning. You have to be very humble to be successful in marketing because, you, I mean, nobody's an expert because it's, it's just changing so fast and, and there's so much to learn every day. And part of it, I suppose, is teaching because the, the whole idea behind marketing is you want to create demand for your product. And that might mean teaching customers something new about how they can live their lives in a different way, in a better way, in a healthier way uh, by using your products. Yeah, definitely. And the comment that you made earlier about your, your daughter, going back to that, uh, you were saying that she's, she said that you explained things well. 
very well. Yeah. I also noticed that in your books as well. Just mm -hmm. The way that you write, I love it personally. I yeah. connect with it personally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you tell stories mm -hmm. and the stories are so easily memorable. Uh, yeah. And, you know, when if you teach someone or you explain something to someone and you do it in a story, that person is more likely to remember. So, yeah. Uh, how would you say, like, what is the connection between storytelling or maybe the advantage between storytelling and marketing? Well, I'm glad you noticed that. And I, I appreciate your, your comments. I, I really model my style off of uh, Malcolm Gladwell. I think my style is very similar to Malcolm, where Malcolm, his, his writing is based on research and facts. It's not his research and facts. Uh, he doesn't do any original research that I know of, but he'll there, there'll be something going on in the world that'll make him go, huh, wow, look what Stanford research found, right? Now, when you, it's too many, too many business books today are just a litany of facts. And that's where you really get lost, right? Um, and the way Malcolm teaches is he'll tell this story, right? And he'll say, oh, well, this, this is what happened to Mrs. Smith. This was this surprising thing. And this and this happened and this happened. And oh my gosh, can you believe it? Well, of course you can. Because in 1975, Stanford Research did this da-da-da-da-da. Okay, now. You may never remember that research, but you'll remember that story. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I teach. That's the way I write. And I spend an enormous amount of time working on those stories and finding the right stories to tell the, to, to tell the tale. Mm -hmm. In Cumulative Advantage, early in the book, I talk about the Winklevoss twins Right, these yeah. are the guys that were on the social network movie. You know, these six foot four beautiful men who were the <laughs> Olympic rowers, and right, and they kind of got screwed by Mark Zuckerberg. But that's only a little part of the story. What happened to them before that and after that is even more interesting. And I thought this was an interesting, an extreme story. To, mm -hmm. to tell, to explain a point in the book. And I spent uh, more than two days writing this story, which took up two pages in the book. Mm -hmm. And I remember going, you know, going from my office and going to dinner that night and talking to my wife saying, nobody would ever believe the amount of work that goes into these stories, that goes into the book. Um, you know, if I were paid by the hour, I'd be doing much better working at McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't think for me, I don't think there's a shortcut. You know, I, I think you're, you, you, you hit it exactly right on the head, Matt, that, that people will connect, they will relate, they will, they will, it will make them feel something as well as learn something. And that's something that a statistic or a chart really can't do they'll mm -hmm. remember the story and that's definitely my style mm -hmm. definitely it's like you're like an idea synthesizer you're taking all these ideas you're putting them together you're piecing yeah. them together like a jigsaw puzzle and you're uh you're doing it in a way that people can totally understand and uh yeah. totally implement in in your life which is another thing that i like about your books is they're precise clear um, you know, there's, there's no fluff to them. I, I don't really like books with fluff. You keep yeah, it concise. Well, that's enough. another. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, one of the little things about my books is that sometimes, well, almost all the time, when you get any sort of business book, the first five pages are like testimonies about how great the book is, which, you know, were written by the person who wrote the book, really. <laughs> and I mean, again, even that to me is, fluff, you know, just like when you get my book, it's like, let's get to the point. I'm not going to waste your time. Let's cut the fluff. There's going to be an idea 
an inspiration on every single page. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna waste your time. Too many business books really are a blog post. They're not a business book. It's one idea that you can explain in a blog post. Mm-hmm. And then there's 240 pages of fluff. And I, I cannot tell you how many business books I read where you read the first two chapters and you think, well, that's really all I need to know. The rest of the <laughs> book is fluff. And that's, that is just cheating the reader, I think. Yeah, I would have to agree. And I always get frustrated when I get books like that. And I was like, oh man, I, yeah. you know, I spent my money and my time on this. I yeah. want to get, I, I could read it on your blog, right? Right, right, <laughs> Not right, your right. Blog, but other people's blogs. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, there was, uh, there was another point that you brought up in a cumulative advantage. And I think maybe marketing rebellion as well. Um, like when you, when you came up with the idea to write the book, you were like, basically you wanted to solve a problem. So yeah. what was that problem that you wanted to solve for uh, the cumulative advantage and the marketing rebellion? I think all, all ideas yeah. start from the problem, right? All business, right. I think so. all marketing, right? Start from yeah. source, some sort of problem. I think so. I mean, I, I figure if <clears throat> if I can observe a problem in the world and figure out how to solve it, that's going to make a good book. That's going to make a relevant book. And I've been fairly consistent. You know, I've been writing a book about every two years or so, but I'll only write a book if it's connected to something going on in the world. For Marketing Rebellion, it was, you know, Back before the pandemic, you know, I was traveling around the world and meeting with a lot of big companies, and I kept hearing the same thing over and over again, that our marketing doesn't work like it used to. I just can't keep up. I'm feeling overwhelmed. And the thing that really, I think, snapped it in place for me, because I never make a quick decision to write a book. It's like, I have an idea. And then I have to make sure it's right because it's such a big commitment to write a book. And I was asked to facilitate a meeting of chief marketing officers. And these were people from very famous companies and they were sitting around this table. And I said, well, what, what's keeping you up at night? Like, what's the big problem that you face? And every single person said, we're falling behind. We can't keep up. Now, these are people with like millions of dollars in budget and working mm-hmm. with the biggest advertising agencies. And so it's just like, why do these people feel like they're falling behind? Why can't they keep up with marketing? And my original thesis was that technology is moving too fast. And what I, when I started to get into the research, I actually had the book, this is a fun fact, had the book like one third written and realized I was wrong. Hmm. I rewrote the book, which was not an easy decision to make. (laughs) But what I realized was technology was only part of it. What was really going on is that our customers have the accumulated knowledge of the human race in the palm of their hand. They can make really good decisions. They don't need to be manipulated. They have a different expectation of businesses and marketing and marketers have missed it. So that's what the marketing rebellion was about. You know, for cumulative advantage, one of the sad things in our world, the hard things, and I'm sure you see it. I mean, you're a creator, um, is that there's so much competition. There's There's so much information density, so many choices in the world that even if we're doing something great, it's probable that we're getting buried. Even if we're proud of our work, we're consistent, we're delivering interesting insights that is just not getting above the noise. And I mean, this is something I live with. It's something my customers live with. I don't want to live with it. We've got to figure out what can we do. So it led me to this idea of momentum. If you're stuck, what are the what could you do to give yourself a boost 
to get to that next level. I think that's a problem, you know, really any content creator is facing today. Certainly any business, any marketer. The, the problem facing every creator, every marketing person today is this. How can I be heard? I just want to be heard. I want to be seen. I want to be discovered. How, I mean, I deserve that. I'm doing my best work. And so, uh, you know, I just dug into it and tried to figure out, you know, what does momentum mean? Mm -hmm. can, can, you know, how does it actually work? And what I found is there's actually been a lot of research and science behind this idea of momentum, but it hasn't really been applied to people and businesses before. So that's what I help, hoped to achieve in cumulative advantage. Mm. Yeah, and you brought up the idea of technology earlier. And I, <laughs> I think a lot of the times, like people see this new app coming out or this new technology, marketers, right? Uh, email campaigns, whatever it may be. Uh, and it can be missed used uh like looking at the next shiny thing right so mm -hmm. how do we avoid that uh and what what's better to do rather than like looking at the next shiny thing because yeah. a lot of marketers feel, said you said that they feel like they're getting behind right this may be yeah. part of it well i, I really um to me it's it, it's not that complicated um, you know, I think it gets down to, to discipline. Um, you know, you have to think about, um, you know, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? How do I deliver something great for my, for my audience, for my customers? Um, you know, for someone like me, um, you know, I started out blogging and, um, uh, and, I, I was blogging for about five years before I decided, well, I want to try doing a, a podcast, but I wanted to do it in a way that wouldn't jeopardize, you know, the big audience I've already created from my blog. And I think one of the problems today is they think they need to be everywhere. They need to, you know, they need to be, do everything everywhere. And the fact is to rise above the noise today, you have to be great and you can't be great in 10 places. You can't, mm -hmm. you have to be great in one place or maybe eventually two places. You've got to be great. And so I, it really gets down to a matter of discipline. Now, if you're a big brand, you can be everywhere. But if it's me and you, we have to really choose where are we going to be and how do we give everything we've got to that audience and that content and then in and not be distracted by you know whatever's whatever's new now you know tiktok something new i mean i'm aware of it i'm kind of seeing how it works i think that's smart but you know i, I don't think it's and and a lot of my friends are saying oh you should be on tiktok well every time you make a choice like that you know, it's intoxicating because you think, oh, well, it's TikTok. It's free, but it's not free. It's a commitment. It's time. Right. It's engagement. It's work. It's planning. It's strategy. <clears throat> and it, it, it takes up more time that can be devoted to, you know, again, mastering one channel and really building a meaningful audience. Mm -hmm. For sure. And it's like, yeah, the return on investment, right? Uh, I I also know of TikTok. I've created a, an account, but I don't really see the return on investment. So I've focused my energy on more long form content yeah. like YouTube podcasts. Uh, those are the two, definitely. Uh, and yeah, I mean, those are definitely, oh yeah, and blog, of course. Uh, those are definitely uh, forms of content that can be evergreen, unlike TikTok yeah. or, or Instagram or Twitter. 
Yeah. And 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 someone might start a a a, a book centered channel on TikTok. And you may go, oh shoot, I wish I had done that. But I mean, you you, you just can't do everything. Yeah, mm-hmm. you just have to be, you have to be, at, you know, you have to pick your lane and it should be a lane that you love because you can't give up. You know, I, I blogged, you know, there was a period I blogged 650 weeks in a row without missing. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, I, you know, my podcast now is going into its 10th year. I've never missed an episode. Uh, and that, you know, that takes a lot of work. It, it takes a lot of commitment. Uh, it takes grit and tenacity. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you, you can't do that everywhere, you know? So yeah. I basically have, you know, I basically have two channels, mm-hmm. blog, podcast, and, you know, dabble a little bit here and there. But, you know, I want to be a great blogger. I want to be a great podcaster. Mm-hmm. And then every couple of years, I'll write a book. Yeah, yeah. I think that's such a great lesson for the people watching and listening right now is like, especially for people who create, you know, content and just, you know, focusing on these like two or three areas uh, and just like doubling down on those, of course, you have to love it as well. And you do. Um, yeah. Cause it does take a lot of time and energy and yeah. grit and perseverance to, to continue. And, and I think, you know, if you, if you don't love it, it will show up, you know, your audience will know it. Mm-hmm. So you've got to have excitement. You've got to have enthusiasm for what you do. And um, that will come through in your content and your audience will love that. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, there was there was this idea that kind of relates to this in a, a cum- cumulative advantage about, well, how to basically reach more people. And uh, I forget the exact term that you used, but basically uh, uh, working your way up the, the ladder of, <laughs> I'm not really phrasing this in the right yeah. way, but basically re- like, how do you reach more people uh, through like your network basically? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it, it, it takes time and, and consistency. And, and the, I think one of the lessons in the book is this idea that there's no overnight success. There just is it. I mean, there might be some fluke where someone gets discovered on YouTube or whatever, but um, if you consider the people that you admire in whatever, in entertainment, in business, um, they've worked for years to get there. And a great lesson for me that I share in the book is that um, a, a rock band that I love is the Black Keys. And they're one of the biggest bands in the world. They can sell out a stadium. And I got to meet them, oh, maybe eight or nine years ago, let's say, seven or eight years ago. And they were still playing halls that could you know, have maybe 2,000 people in it but they had just released a a record that was just blasting off. Mm -hmm. And I talked to the drummer of the band, Patrick Carney, and I said, "What what was the catalyst? What finally got you to break through? And he said, there wasn't one. He said, we've been making records for seven years. We've been touring for seven years. Every week, every month, you do a little bit better. You make better records. You try to have better shows. And you build your audience over time. There's no no shortcut. That's the way you do it. And, you know, I recently had a marketing, hosted a marketing retreat here in Knoxville called The Uprising. Uh, I live in Knoxville, Tennessee. And this is the best thing I've done in my career. I had people come from all over the world to spend two and a half days with me. And we, we had great discussions 
on the future of marketing. And we had fun together and we had great food together. Now, I couldn't have done that 10 years ago. I couldn't have done it. I couldn't have done it eight years ago. I couldn't have done it five years ago, but I can do it now because I was consistent and I didn't give up. And hmm. every year you have more opportunities. You have more connections. You're known, right? So, I mean, a lot of people in today's world, they want instant gratification. They want it now. And they see everybody else moving up and they say, well, I want to be there. That's just not how it works. It's, it's really how it, it's never worked that way. And if you think of all the people you admire, behind them somewhere is those 10 years of effort that got them to where they are today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you just have to be consistent and just, just like the black keys do a little bit better month by month by month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a little bit of a deliberate practice as well, getting better and better uh, consistently every single day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. Uh, and there was this idea of uh, like marketing is a mix between psychology, anthropology, and soci sociology. I thought this yeah. was really cool. Uh, and there, you, you know, you've also got the what four other um, like trust and uh, was it belonging? belonging. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, can you touch a little bit on that? Well, the 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 Marketing Rebellion book, I regard as, as a wake-up call. It's, it's just a kind of snap marketing people and, and you know entrepreneurs and business people out of their slumber and have them wake up and say, hey, here's how the world is really working today. It's, it's you know, you, you've been doing the same thing over and over and over and over again for years. And one of the reasons that, they're asleep and that marketing is kind of sick right now is because we've become too intoxicated by technology. And whenever we talk about technology, about marketing, we talk about our MarTech stack and our automation and our algorithms and our dashboards. And the reason I got into marketing is um, I was a a journalism major in college and I took a marketing class as an elective and I opened up this marketing book principles of marketing by Dr. Philip Kotler. And he said, marketing, like you said, is a combination of anthropology, sociology, and psychology. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. One, one major is all things human sociology, anthropology, psychology, all in one thing. That's just, it's, it seemed irresistible to me. And mm -hmm. I would have changed my major, but I, it was too late. I needed to get my degree <laughs> and get a job because I was out of money. But I ended up minoring in marketing and then eventually got my MBA. And I think today the biggest problem is that businesses and marketers have forgotten what we're about, psychology, mm -hmm. sociology, anthropology. And they're, they're looking at emails and they're looking at, you know, blasting people with spam. That's not human. That's not sociology, anthropology, and psychology. It's abusing people. Mm -hmm. And my challenge in the book is to look at what you're do doing in your business and your marketing. If you're doing things that people hate, stop it. And you know what you're doing because if people did that to you, I had this crazy, I mean, this inter, I had this interaction on LinkedIn the other day. It was bizarre. <laughs> so on LinkedIn, you know, people that are spamming you all the time. And there was this, there was this guy and he sent me this spam thing. Oh, you know, I'd really like to learn about what you do. Can we hop on a call for 10 minutes? And usually I just say no. But for some reason, there was something about this guy. I decided I would respond. I said, do you realize how easy it is 
to learn about what I do. All you got to do is look, if you really want to know what I do, <laughs> have to just do the nice thing and look at my LinkedIn profile and make some connection. I said, you're just spamming me. And I get spammed by 12 people a day. And I don't like this practice. And then he responded in the course of defending himself. <laughs> he said, well, I get spammed 12 days, 12 times a day too. So I know what it's like. So to me, this was so illogical that he hates what he's doing, but he's defending it somehow. <laughs> if, you, if you know what you're doing, doing is bothering people, stop it and figure out what can I do that people like? What can I do to help people, to be generous, to teach them, to connect to them in a, in a meaningful way? And I mentioned to him, when someone that I know, like you, you asked me to be on your podcast, Matt, mm -hmm. I'm going to say yes, because you and I have been connected for two years, right? I know you, you've connected to me in a meaningful way. So when you want my help, I'm going to say yes. I always say yes to people who I know. I do everything I can to help people that I know. But if you're a stranger asking for 10 minutes of my time, there's no way I'm going to let that get through. That's, you know, I would spend my whole life doing that. So that's really the challenge is to stop, you know, stop doing what people hate double down on what uh on what people love mm -hmm. yeah i mean making connections takes time right i mean yeah. it takes time and effort and a lot of people are very impatient and they just want to get straight to the point which doesn't work if you don't know the person <laughs> yeah definitely and like this i think that's also what interests me about marketing and and everything is it relates to our psychology, it, waits to the, it relates to the way that we communicate with people. And uh, I think that's such a, a very important skill, not just in marketing, but in life. And, uh, you know, in order to connect with other people, we need to learn about how to communicate well and uh, genuinely talk with people, genuinely uh, show interest in people. And uh, yeah, so definitely um, that I really loved that aspect in your book and you got the graph and everything and that just really stood out to me yeah thanks yeah so um what is your biggest advice for people today uh whether that be marketing or trying to you know grow your brand or you know whatever it may be well it, it's uh the um it, it's sort of like wraps a ribbon around what we've been talking about so far. The subtitle of Marketing Rebellion is The Most Human Company Wins. And the reason I chose that was because I think that's the future of marketing. I had an interesting experience last summer. Um, I grew up in, uh, in Pittsburgh and had not been back there for decades, really. And I visited a store that my grandparents used to go to. My, this was a store that's been there since 1903. Mm. And you walk in this store, it has the old wood floors and all the signs are like handwritten. This is what we have today. This is what's the prices. And there's a case that's 30 feet long that has every kind of cheese, and smoked meat and sausage you can imagine. And this, this little elderly lady comes up and she says, oh, hello, Mary, how are you doing? And the lady behind the counter says, oh, dear heart, it's so nice to see you. How's Jimmy? How's his leg? Oh, thank you for asking. Jimmy's doing great. You know, he's starting to get around much better now. And the lady behind the counter says, you know, I got something special today. I'm going to wrap up a little something special. You take it home for Jimmy. Jimmy, I think he's going to like that. And I stood there watching this and everybody's talking to each other. Everybody at this counter knows each other. 
And I felt deeply sad because there's no place I go that would wrap up a little something extra for me. You know, nobody knows me. Nobody knows my life. And yet, this is how we bought and sold from each other for all of history. And this idea of mass marketing, mass production, and advertising is a relatively short period in the history of the human race. And I think deep in our hearts, we want that connection. We want that belonging. And the reason that store stands out compared to any other store I would go into is because they're human. They're real people, real faces, real smiles, and they care and they show they care. Now, that's a little harder perhaps in the digital world, or maybe it's a little easier because we can kind of do it you know, at scale. And I think we have in our hearts, especially after this pandemic, this longing for real, authentic human connection and belonging. And if you can do that, you're going to win. If you are the most human university, insurance company, symphony, daycare center, whatever, that's what's going to win because that's what people are going to talk about. You know, this lady, she's going to go home and tell her neighbors, oh, I was down at the, at the Italian store and look what they did. They packed up this little thing for Jimmy. Aren't those people just the nicest people? And they'll 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 always they'll never go anywhere else because they belong there. If you if you can create a sense of belonging, you don't need any other marketing. You don't need SEO. You don't need advertising because you have everything you need because your customers belong and they're going to bring their they're going to bring everybody else into because they you know they're going to want others to belong. Mm-hmm. Definitely. That's so, so that's a long way of saying <laughs> the, the most human company wins would be my piece of advice is just, you know, find ways to show your smile, show your heart, show your passion, your compassion in a way mm-hmm. that is true. And that will carry you a long way. Mm. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so, uh, yeah, is there uh where can people find you where can people buy your book uh, is there anything else you would like to add to this conversation well first the only thing i'd like to add is just to thank you so very much for this has been one of the best interviews ever matt because you're so well prepared you've really read uh my books i can tell that this is something you love and that you're passionate about it so thank you for doing such a great job Mm -hmm. And it's easy to find me. You don't have to remember my name. All you have to remember is businesses grow. If you can remember businesses grow, you can find my blog, my podcast, my books, lots of free, cool resources for businesses of every size. My books are uh, on Amazon. They're on on Barnes and Noble. Um, And you can learn about them on my website. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I will include all of those links uh in the description for everyone watching and and uh listening and thank you so much mark for coming on the show i really appreciate it for a great job yeah thank you cool great and everyone i'll see you in the next episode